Hello brothers and sisters. It took me a minute to get the camera angle right there. So I have a stack of books right here. I have four books and this is going to actually be the next study. And it's going to be from Paul's Metaphors by David Williams. Harvest of Hellenism by F.E. Peters. The um, Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola and George Barna. And the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Gerard Kittle. And in that study, the next study, I'm going to be talking about liturgy. Now, there's a reason why I'm setting these to the side right now. And I'm going to be reading from two entries from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. This is two separate books here. And there's a reason why I'm doing this, okay? This study right here is going to capitalize on liturgy. And I'm going to read very thoroughly on some of the things that I've connected together about the way that Ptolemy connected the liturgies together in an amalgamation when the Grecians occupied most of the known world at that time, just like Babylon and Persia had done before them, and then eventually Rome occupied that power that they absorbed from that Grecian rule, from Seleucus, Ptolemy, Cassander, and Lysimachus. And those were the four generals under Alexander the Great. So the reason I mention that is because Ptolemy in Egypt absorbed this worship of this serpent god named Serapis, and they were called the Serapium the cult there, the, the cult of Serapis, the serpent god, kind of like Aesilapius or Satan. And the reason I'm going to bring out the Paul's metaphors is explain some more on that liturgy and the more of a technical look at it. And then Harvest of Hellenism has more about that as well. So there's a few things. There's a lot of things, and pagan Christianity is going to actually outline what a liturgy looks like and exactly what a liturgy is. But the reason I have to do this one first is this is what ties it all together. This is what dawned on me. This is why I'm doing it like this. Because if you want to understand the scriptural mark of the beast, you have to understand nationalism, patriotism, and its tie to religion, okay? Nationalism is a religion. Whenever you see election time come about and you see this war being perpetuated and propagated in the media between the Republicans and the Democrats, and you see these people at war and they're fighting, trust me, that is more religious than religion has ever been. <laughs> so, to in, in order to understand true religion in this world, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of Christ, the Church of Latter-day Saints, which is Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, sorry if I said the same ones, Pentecostalism, the Anglican, you name it. That is the same thing as nationalism, and that's the same thing as the nationalism tied to religion. To set a man up, a man who's been apotheosis sized and they've been made they've made him as though he is apotheosis which means to become a god and they heroify him oh he's a hero and he's standing up there and the crowd's cheering and boy he's got his zeal on right Donald Trump and Hillary and boy they're just full of 
righteous indignation, right? And they have these crowds and the crowds just moving and it's kind of like at a stadium when they're doing a wave, right? That is worship. That is worship to the highest degree. Nationalistic worship is more worshipful than anything you see in a Baptist church. And and way more fooled with zeal in a copy of as though it is godliness, right? Like it's ungodliness, but it looks like what you would imagine some really ecstatic worshipers worshiping. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just this charismatic movement of nationalistic pride that we see in the media, especially come election time, right? That we got to hang them out to dry and fry them, right? Hillary let all these Marines die over there. And, and boy, Donald Trump, he's just a, you know, he's a celebrity. And he, what's he doing being president? You know, and people get all hyped up. And well, anyways, the mark of the beast is the state's stamp of approval on religious decrees. Get a pen and write that down. And while you write that down, write this down too. I'm glad I said that because it clicked. So the mark of the beast is the state's stamp and approval on religious decrees. And so while you write that down, also write this down because I want y'all to remember y'all can always contact me. So my phone number is 843-441-6878. So 843-441-6878. And if you ever wanted to call and chat or just talk, feel free, please. I'm not mean and I'm not trying to be worshipped by anybody. I'm just a guy who's outside feeding my chickens and feeding Nemo and um, we got some ducks today, some little chick ducks, I guess you call it baby ducks. So, you know, it's just like, I mean, we can talk about things in real life. Like, it doesn't have to be like the world makes it where they set their leader up and they're scared of them. And So, anyways, or if you don't want to call, you can also send me an email at Jeremiah, J-E-R-E-M-I-A-H-K, Mills, M-I-L-L-S, so Jeremiah K. Mills at gmail.com. So if y'all ever wanted to send me a, a call or a, a text, you can text that number as well if you're a little shy about talking, So or you can shoot me an email. So anyways, all right, so I'm open to Karagma and the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Gerard Kittle. And I'm open to dogma. Yes, these are Greek words. Character comes from a word karasso. Character is an exact Greek word. Yes, our English word character is an exact Greek word. And it comes from a word karasso, which means a scraping or an etch, something that's etched out. And karagma which is the word for mark. You can imagine a mark as a marking or an etch or that scratching, right? The same word where our character, word character comes from because character is a shaping and a molding. Like in the Marine Corps, they said, we break you down and build you back up like molding clay. Well, Isaiah said the same thing about God. God says, can the thing formed say to the one who formed it, why hast thou made me thus? So, why have you made me like this, right? Well, he shapes our character. Even in Romans 9, a verse people don't like at all, it says, vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And, and that means that they're fully accomplished, that there's actually an order an, an orizo, where we get our word horizon, like you hear orizo, hori, 
horizon, like that's, we get our English word horizon from the Latinized form, horizon of that Greek word, horizo. So, we're going to begin reading here in dogma. This is the word that was translated in Colossians 2, where we always talk about how all the rituals have been done away with. No one can tell you you have to eat a cracker Drink a thimble of grape juice. Those are all man-made rituals. Jesus was eating an entire meal at Passover, and he hadn't been nailed to the cross yet. Colossians chapter 2 says, When he was nailed to the cross, all the rituals went away. So people say, Well, wasn't Jesus baptized? Yes, before he was nailed to the cross. Then they'll say, Well, Jesus, was, didn't he say, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and drink, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Yes, he did. But that was before he was nailed to the cross. And in John chapter 6, he actually tells us that his flesh and his blood is truth. When it says, my blood is drink indeed, my flesh is meat indeed. That word indeed means of truth. And at the end of John chapter 6, he goes on to say, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And true believers, that's our recognition. We recognize the words and the actions in other believers because it can't be it can't be hid with that. It can't be hid with the words and the actions. So without further ado, I'm gonna read dogma. So it says no one has the right to hold you down to rituals anymore. Ordinances that men have made, man-made ordinances, they teach the commandments of men, they teach for doctrines the commandments of men, Isaiah said. And it says, and that's where it says that they honor me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. And that's what Jesus repeated. And that's where they were saying, why don't your disciples wash their hands? He was repeating Isaiah. So dogma, we don't follow dogma. That's why I talk about the dogma of the Trinity, the false doctrine man-made of the Trinity are the false man-made doctrines of the essentials and the fundamentals. The essentials and the fundamentals of the faith. I'm going to give you my statement of faith. All those are just churchianity buzzwords. Like, And, and I've broken down in, in depth this idea that people have created called the, the dogma, the man-made doctrine of the Trinity. It was invented in 180 A.D., by a man named Tertullian and a man named Theophilus. And we can read more on that. I'm sure we will soon. So, anyways, these man-made doctrines. So, the, the state's approval of religious decrees. The state's approval and affirmation on religious decrees. Now, dogma is this decree. That's what we're going to read about. So, the basic meaning of the word is ta de degmana, what seems to be right. So, what seems to be right? A opinion. An opinion, right? Especially in Plato. Imagine that, Plato showing up here, the Greek philosopher, right? The derived meaning, philosophical opinion. Philosophical opinion. Principle. A principle or doctrine is rarer in Plato, but is more common in later philosophy from the time of Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle showing up here. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's what we've studied in the McClintock and Strong. That's what we've studied in the, re, re, the Cyclopedia of Religion and Ethics by James Hastings. As we've seen, Aristotle and Plato are the people they follow. Aristotelian logic, Platonic logic. They're not trying to follow Jesus and what the Bible says. They're trying to look real good in the colleges. So, it says that, um, sorry, it says, So the principles of the good and the beautiful in which children are instructed, but is more common in later philosophy from the time of Aristotle. So instructing the children, right? It says, 
This says the principles of the good and the beautiful in which children are instructed. You want to teach them about the good and the beautiful. But you also want to teach them about the stressful and the bad, see? Because that's called utilitarianism. When, oh, life's just butterflies and rainbows and a utopia. No, it isn't. Life is stressful from moment to moment to moment. Something gets tangled up. Something gets in a mess and you got to untangle it and it's stress and you're mad and you're angry and you're saying things you regret. We should, we should teach people that as well so they don't feel like they're doing something wrong when they are feeling stressed out. Because we all experience those stresses. So it says, the doctrine of the Essenes, so go, going on, sorry, from the basic meaning there also derives a sense of what is resolved, the resolution of an individual or an assembly, so a resolution or what is resolved. This is used religiously in a particular writer's work, according to God's decree, so according to God's decree. Usually the emphasis lies on the fact of publishing a decree, official ordinance, or edict. So, Caesar would publish a decree, it says. Or if we look in the book of Acts, there were four things. There were four things that the disciples told the people not to do. They, they didn't tell them or t told them what they needed to do. And it wasn't go get dunked in water. It wasn't eat crackers and grape juice. It was abstain from fornication Do not eat things strangled, do not eat blood, and abstain from idols. Four things. Four things. So, there was also four things that Jethro told Moses. He said, find able men who love the truth, hating covetousness, wanting more, and uh, sorry, what was the fourth one? It's, it's to, it said that they were able men, loved the truth. I'm sorry, one moment. So, able men, love truth, hate, hating covetousness, and I think the fourth one was fear God, but it's been a little while since I've read that, so they, they, Able men love the truth, hate covetousness, and fear God. I think that's what it is. It's been a while, so, but I'll draw that out in another study. So, well, anyways, it goes on to say that, so, pub so publishing a decree or official ordinance or edict. So, it goes on to say, it is hardly surprising that this sense intersects with that of teaching under the Torah becomes a system Comparable with the dogmata of philosophy, it contains the sacred principles of divine philosophy. So you can already see how this begins to get mixed up here because there's a big difference between God's commandments and a man-made philosophy, see? The verb dogmatids are not found in older Greek and in another writing, only in another writing. There's a lot of writings, I don't know the abbreviation, so is in full accord with the meaning of the noun, to represent and affirm an opinion or tenet, to establish or publish a decree, resolve of the community to proclaim an edict. So, in the New Testament, the Lucan writings and Hebrews use the noun in the sense of the imperial decree regarding the census. In Luke 2, 1, the decree of Pharaoh concerning the killing of children. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, in imperial prescripts in Acts 17, 7. So, um, it says, so whenever we think of this to establish or publish a decree, I want y'all to remember it's the state's stamp on religious decrees. And I want you to think of the Constantine in 325 AD when the Caesar took over 
so-called nominal Christianity, right? So-called Christianity, but it it was churchianity. That's when the shift was made and the state took over what people thought was Christianity, but the state can't take over Christianity. They don't have that power. So it just became churchianity. And in King James 1611, following in the Bishop's Bible, the Elizabethan Bible of the hierarchy and of the monarchy, they had their nationalistic pride. Sorry, one second. I think someone was knocking just now. So they had their nationalistic pride, and they put their stamp on religious decrees. Uh, I, maybe it was just my chickens. Sorry. Yeah, it was probably just my chickens thumping around in there. Or, not chickens, but my little ducks. Sorry. So, okay. Alright, might have to adjust the camera again. This is always fun, trying to find the right spot. So, anyways. I want you to think of that. The Council of Nicaea and the 1611 translations. Those were major, major points in the in how we got our modern religion of church and how the nationalistic state intervenes in these religious ideas, right? That churchianity. And then it mixes everybody up and they don't understand how God even fits in all that, you know? Oh, excuse me, sorry. So it says both the noun and the verb are given a special emphasis in Colossians and Ephesians. Colossians 2.14, and this is the important ones that I always am explaining. Colossians chapter 2, where all of the rituals have been blotted out. We're not keeping Sabbath days, new moon days, these feasts that they want us to keep. God has freed us and made those things spiritual. We see them spiritually now. So it says, in Colossians 2.14, might perhaps be construed grammatically as the inscription, something belonging to, sorry, it's a lot of Greek and it's, I don't know all these words, so, so that the dogmata would be the new command or edict of God. On the other hand, the link with 2.20 excludes a strict equation of the noun and the verb, and here the reference is undoubtedly to ordinances of touch and taste. The usage of Hellenistic Judaism would thus refer to a, a Greek phrase in the Mosaic Law and its demands as the content of the Greek word kerogrophon and its hostility to man. Hence, as Christ is elsewhere just described as the end of the law, so we are, to, we are told here that the dogmata are blotted out by him and that dogmatizestai is brought to an end. The construction and chain of thought are much the same in Ephesians 2.15, namely that the mosaic nomoston entolon, which consists in dogmata, is set aside by Christ. As Philo and Josephus appropriated to the divine law a term used for philosophical principles and imperial edicts. So philosophical principles and imperial edicts. So the Christian community very quickly began to adopt a similar usage. And churchianity was beginning at that point, right? Or picking up steam. In Acts 16.4, which we talked about a moment ago, the word signifies the resolutions and decrees of the early gathering in Jerusalem, which are to be sent out to the cities of the first missionary journey. In the post-apostolic fathers, the word comes to be applied to the teachings of and prescriptions of Jesus. So if I skip around sometimes, sorry, it's just reading these Greek words probably isn't going to help very much. So unless you get a copy of this and actually go to your dictionary and look up the Greek word, we're just gleaning out the places where it's actually showing us the definitions, but I would like to read to you a little bit too so you can understand what it's saying. So in an ancient prayer dating from the 4th century, it said this Greek phrase that's inserted here. It says, From the time of 
a particular writing, a distinction is drawn between the two parts of Christian teaching, ta kerugmata and ta dogmata. In the canons of the councils, dogmatizo is used in the same sense as orizo, a boundary. So we talked about that. So Now, there's differences between good decrees and bad decrees, between God's decrees and man's decrees, right? So, now we're looking at karagma, and it's short and sweet here, and it says, now, karagma is an etching which has a boundary, right? Just like dogma is a boundary. Now we see this etching of people who have bad character, bad aim, all about money, rank, position, arrogance, hedonism, right? Doing whatever you want. And not even feeling bad about it, not repenting, not saying sorry, not wanting, even wanting to turn to God or have a desire for a better, more holy life because all the enjoyment and pleasure is in all of the rioting and the gambling and the strip clubs and the sex and all of the things that we need to conduct ourselves better to not want to do those things, and that's where the miracle of God's conversion comes in, which changes us and makes us trust in God, which is the definition of faith, and lean on God, and that's what repentance is, that turning towards God and from the things of the world, the organizations of man. So, karagma here, in the Greek world, it's it's saying in the Greek world, so, karagma is an engraved, etched, branded, or inscribed mark or sign. And this is what mark of the beast is, this karagma. And like we said, the karagma is the imperial stamp on decrees. And where I learned that phrase is right here. I learned it right here from this book. Because it says right here, I'm looking at it, it says especially the imperial stamp, the imperial stamp, Constantine's, or... King James stamped to attest the validity of decrees. Who gives them the power to choose what's right in God's eyes when what they're saying contradicts God? Well, people do, not God. God's saying, what are you doing, right? All through scripture, I'm the king. I'm in charge, God says, over and over and over again. So, it says, closest to the original sense of karasso, which is where this word comes from. That's where the word character comes from, karasso. Is the earliest example in this particular writing where karagma denotes the bite of a snake. Elsewhere, the term means an inscription or anything written. An inscription or anything written like a seal, right? A king's seal. It's a mark. It's a stamp. Something that has a king's seal. A brand to mark camels are often an official stamp on writings, e.g. attested copies of documents, especially, or, yeah, and it goes on, especially the imperial stamp to attest the validity of decrees. Can also mean the impression on coins. Like when Jesus said, whose inscription is this? Caesar's. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. But they want to combine it. Nationalism, and patriotism, and this heroification and apotheosis of these church, so-called church leaders, is what we see is this imperial stamp, because they make themselves authorities. They think that they have the authority to do what their philosophical opinions want. So it says, then it can mean money in general. So, karagma does not occur in the Septuagint. Karaso is used in the Septuagint in the sense to inscribe. So, it goes on, it says, Revelations 13, 11 through 18, describes the appearance of the second beast, which comes as a pseudo-prophet of the first beast. 
so Babylon and Rome, but fill in the gaps, it goes Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism. So Babylonianism and Roman Catholicism, it's all been handed down that chain of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, Roman Catholicism, now the Reformation. It was about reforming Roman Catholicism. And this is going to take us directly into this four-book study I have over here on liturgy. The binding to make you go through a ritual using the law. The law dictates the ritual of your life. So, would you rather follow God or would you rather follow man? Well, when I was going in this churchianity system... They were following man. They weren't following God. They had little cliques and hierarchies not following God at all that I saw. I didn't see them following God. So I saw them following these little people like the deacons and the favorite person of the deacon, the person who gets the pat on the back. They give them a reward. Oh, here's some candy. It's like at school, right? Give the candy to the popular kids and then the little... The little heathen kids from poor homes will have to listen, right? The little strangers, the little outsiders, right? If you got brown in your skin, look at these white kids over here that we give the candy to. And that's how they dictated it, right? I mean, it was racism, racist. What do you think these churches are? These people in these churches. I see so much racism all the time. I'm amazed at how naive I've been my whole life. I'm like... People are this racist? Really? I mean, I can't believe it. I'm astonished I was that naive, but I see it more and more of how racist people are. So, it goes on to say, it says, describes the appearance of the second beast. And that beast system, like we said, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the Reformation, and all the stuff we see today. That's the beast the churchianity beast demanding religious recognition of its cultic image. Pastor, oh father, pastor, he's a great man. He deserves adoration and obedience and we must grovel before his feet. That's how they treat the Pope. That's how they treat Donald Trump. That's how they treat Hillary. That's how they treat Oprah Winfrey. That's how they treat Joel Osteen. That's how they treat people down the street here at the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Church of Christ Church, right? Pentecostal Church. The incident gains in dramatic force as this image itself comes to life and begins to speak. Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 13. It demands of all men without exception to worship, right? So... That the religious totalitarianism of emperor worship is vindicated here is evident. The heroification and apotheosis of these men we're talking about. That the religious totalitarianism of emperor worship is vindicated here is evident. It was like, Adolf Hitler, what a great man. Mussolini, what a great man. Oh, God save the king, right? And that's how they treat people in our country and in other countries. That's how they're demanded to treat their cultic image of a president, a Caesar, or a Pharaoh, right? That's what we see happening. At the churches, in our homes, worshiping people. People idolize other people like this. Probably the choice of the word karagma points to this if the reference is to the imperial stamp. Probably the choice of word karagma points to this if the reference is to the imperial stamp. Constantine, King James, controlling the religion creating their own authorities and their own liturgies that have no place in Scripture. You can't find it anywhere. Materially, however, 
or sorry, where you do find it, actually you can find it in Scripture. When I'm saying that, I'm saying I'm leaning to the good thing Scripture says. But in the bad context, it points to the leaven of Herod, who was the governor, and the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. These men who walked around in the robes and, oh, to nice tuxedos, right? That's the evil people, the Scripture explains. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. J John chapter 13. Materially, however, the required acceptance of the karagma, the mark, the mark of the beast, right, means religious signing with the mark of the beast. Religious signing with the mark of the beast which is branded on the right hand or the forehead. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, I believe it is. I know it's Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, R make God's law as a sign on your hand and on your forehead. And even in Revelations, it speaks of having the mark on your hand and your forehead in a good context. See, there's a bad people doing evil thing with the mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And then also in Scripture, like in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God commands us to have a mark on our forehead and on our hand of what is good. Put the good things with your hands. Do the good things with your hands. Do the good things with your thoughts. Think good thoughts with your forehead. That's a sign. The works of your hands... The works of your mind. Give them to God, right? But their hands are for money, right? Isn't that what happens in Revelation? The merchants are crying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Oh, our money. Oh, our wool and our precious things are all gone. And Canaan, Ham, Nimrod, that's where the darkness and the blackness and the sin and the iniquity Adam and Eve's sin of being lifted up, wanting to be king, and all of this desire for merchandise and greedy gain is a picture of sin and iniquity all through Scripture. It holds true from there, from all the way from the beginning to the end, it holds true. That's what God's word, that's what God's word does. That's why we believe it. This marking as stigmatization, this marking as stigma, like if you do something bad, we say that was a, that's a stigma against you. That's a mark against you. <clears throat> so that's the words we need to remember here. Stigma, dogma, and mark. Stigma, dogma, mark. This mark as stigmatization was common in antiquity, as slaves were shown to be their master's property by stigmata, a mark. How do we recognize who these people's masters are, whether it's God or man, whether they're serving God or they're serving man? That's how we know. That's the stigma. That's the mark. That's the karagma. That's the dogma that they follow. They're not following God's commands. They're not following the dogma of the disciples and of Jesus. They're following these other things. These man-made, churchianity. They created their language, churchianese. So many people had the marks of deities branded on them in temples. So many people had the marks of deities branded on them in temples. In Revelation 13, 18, the mark of the beast is described as the name of the beast. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the Reformation, Protestant Reformation, and church, churchianity. That's what the beast is. And the serpent is what gives the beast. Voice is the voice box of the beast. Adam, sin of being lifted up and arrogance, wanting to be in God's stead, be in his place. And then Nimrod went and said, I'm going to do that. 
And we see it in these cities, states, these rulers, these ruling headquarters. Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, the living, the seemingly living man who's actually dead, the Frankenstein. It's been jolted and it seems to have life, right? The institutions, the corporations, the marketing, mark, the merchants, commerce, mercury, which is connected to Ham and the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Ham, Cush, Nimrod, the burnt ones, the ones of Hermes. Hermes is Mercury. Her is Ham. Noah had three sons. Ham, Cush, uh, sorry, Ham, Japheth, and, and Seth, or I'm sorry, Shem, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, the three sons. Ham, Canaan, Canaan means merchant. Merc comes from Mercury. Mercury is the same god as Hermes. Hermes is connected to Ham, Ham, Cush, Nimrod. Remember that, Adam, Sin, Nimrod, Connected to the merchants of the earth. Who's weeping in Revelations because Babylon is falling? The merchants. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, Protestant Reformation, Churchianity. So the mark so it says the mark of the beast is described as the name of the beast concealed in the number 666. If Nero is in view, the Caesar, the emperor, the meaning of the number fits the context best, for in this case there is confrontation between the claim of the emperor and that of Christ. Psalm chapter 2, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel against Yahweh and his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from off of us. So yeah, that was in view, I bet, with John, but you have to realize the eschatology of it resounding, folding in past, present, and future that this battle of the sons of light and the sons of darkness wages on. The authorities of this earth who think that they have control against the ones that God has set as his. There is confrontation between the claim of the emperor and that of Christ, whose seal is borne by the 144,000 servants of God, which is the completed church, were included in that. The completed, sorry, not the completed church, the completed believers, the assemblies. All of them throughout time. Of God who belonged to him. Revelation 7, 1-8. through The fact that this politico, politico state, nationalistic, patriotism, religious, politio, politico religious clash is meant may be seen from other passages in Revelation which refer back to 13, 16 forward. The angel in 14.9, 11, threatens with eschatological wrath all those who have accepted the kerogma of the beast. Money, power, position. That's the mark of the beast. That's what Adam did and Eve did with, with the Satan's doctrine. The, Satan, the serpent is the voice box of the beast. And the Satan and serpent, devil, dragon are all the same, according to Revelation. And that drives the beast forward from Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the Reformation, the church. That's what Pharaoh was doing wrong. He was being worshipped. That's what Caesar was doing wrong. He was being worshipped. That's what the president does wrong. He's being worshipped. That's what they're doing wrong in all these schools, churches, businesses, and government. is allowing men to worship them. It's everywhere. The execution of this threat is described in 16.2 in judgment on the beast and his false prophet in 1920, while in 24, of this is all of Revelation, all those who have not worshipped the beast or his image 
nor accepted his marks on the hand or forehead are exalted as eschatological judges. They have been the true judges to the beginning of time, the one who follows God, the ones who follow God. In Acts 17, 19, we read in Paul's address on the Areopagus, whatever, whatever, on the Areopagus, sorry. So in Acts 17, 19, we read in Paul's address on the Areopagus, and it has a big Greek phrase, is used here in the same sense as handiwork. What men have made cannot be. Be like the divine. Let's read that again. Churchianity. True Christians. Let's put this phrase together and see if we can make sense of it. Churchianity. What men have made cannot be like the divine. What men have made cannot be like the divine. Wrap your mind around that, churchianity. And wrap your mind around that, true believers. But men, as the creatures of God, are his offspring and are thus close to him. The believing men. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that study. In the next study, we're going to read from these four books here about the liturgy and how this nationalism and this stamp on religious decrees is what we see happening. So and it's going to be more about how the law and the rituals are controlling us. So I hope that this helps and I hope that you enjoyed this and I'll see you all.